quickly, the reason I think I've been invited here today is probably just to entertain and to tell you a ridiculous story about, I think, the enormous value that is in this industry and also um, to share with you the bravery of what innovation can do. So I started a business when I was 23. Um, I sold it when I was 40. I had no idea that I was going to become an entrepreneur. I didn't know what an entrepreneur was. And worse than that, it took me nine years to write a business plan and understand what strategy was. So I had a lot to learn. And what happened is over a 17 year, year period, I, I, I learned stuff. And I learned that through trialing stuff, which actually is innovation, is it not? So very quickly, I had a business that supplied the miniature luxury branded toiletries that if you stay in pucker super supreme hotels, you should find Bulgari and Asprey and Panhaligans and Elemis and Aveda and, and just some of the most lovely products that you will ever come across in the world. Um, and the reason these companies do this is because, frankly, they're brand marketing. And it's, a, it's, it's an industry that evolved in the last 30 years because when I began, there was only really one player. That just shows you how old I am. Um, so this was uh, my company. And to give you an idea, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the brand This Works, but This Works were not doing very well in England, and I went to them and I said, Crown Plaza, and I was pushing my luck, it was just before I sold the business, so I needed to milk revenue like mad. I pushed my luck, and I knew Crown Plaza had a sleep program, and I said to This Works, you've got this fantastic product called Deep Sleep, how about I put uh, it up as an opportunity for Crown Plaza to do a sleep program, or put it on the pillow of every Crown Plaza? And we sold 1.8 million uh, This Works Deep Sleep sets to Crown Plaza, 1.8 million <coughs> units put into the hands of the consumer that Crown Plaza paid for. Get in, right? That's a great marketing campaign, and that's basically what my business was built on. It was built on finding the synergy between brand placement in the right environment and the trial opportunity that, if you like, forced the guest into getting to know the brand. So you may not have known Aveda in Europe, but when we launched Aveda, Rosemary and Mint Shampoo into hotels uh, in the right eco environment in the new Indigo group owned by Intercon, there was a total brand synergy about the message of the brand and, in their case, post-consumer recycled packaging and the right environmental meant it. So that's my background. And these are some of the gorgeous properties that's irrelevant. It just says to you, I've been to some really cool places. Nowadays, I can afford to stay there. I didn't when I was building my business. Um, in front of you, you have a small gift. I'd like you to have a go, please. Uh, you don't have to have a go, but you could have a sniff. Um, the having a go is putting it on your, your skin and taking an inhalation, because I'm going to talk to you about innovation, not just being about the product and the packaging, but actually about the delivery vehicle and the mechanisms of how we think about consumer usage. Um, and I'm going to touch upon some of the innovations that seem common sense but they've not necessarily been enacted. Uh, so here is a, a miniature portable aromatherapy mood balm, which was invented, frankly, out of consumer frustration. In my last year of Pacific Direct, I had quite a busy tra travel schedule. I was abroad 221 nights of that year. So I traveled a lot, and I used to use oils and shower gels and Elemist Instant Refreshing Gel to put on the back of my neck and Aromatherapy Associates to wake me up in the middle of a bloody night where I was in another country and I had to call the kids before they went to school and have that ridiculous phone call. Um, and we invented this because it's portable mood therapy that will never leak under pressure and it's bloody brilliant. And it's selling like hotcakes in Space NK. And it was just to say to you, I think that innovation is also about today I just made a comment. I bet you have handbags and office bags. And the truth is, your whole world is in your bag. Anybody disagree? Is your passport in there? Your makeup bag, what you're going to put your face on, your computer, so your whole office, right? Is it in there? It's in there. So then we have to think really intelligently about compacting, portability. And actually, this is also the diversification diversification of a range which extends brilliance in fragrance. So I thought that was quite an interesting thing to touch upon. This is what I'm roughly going to talk about. I'm appallingly bad at sticking to slides. 
So on the table, you have stress less and um, focus. You can share them depending on how bad I am. Um, the other thing that I want you to do is I want you to, there's a little pouch on your table. And I want to demonstrate something with you in a minute. So we're going to go through that ritual. But let me just get further on. Um, innovation costs money. Does it? I mean, Unilever spell, spend a billion on it, right? Yeah, a billion in R&D, you quoted, right, Graham? Um, I'm quite enterprising, and I think you can do it bootstrap. I think it comes in the shape of a bottle of wine on a Friday. Anybody not think you can innovate on a Friday night with a bottle of wine? Here's my point. Whatever you do in innovation, there's no excuse not to do it, right? I, I sometimes talk on fast business growth in SMEs, and in, in England, we have a city called Birmingham, and you can fly to 28 places in Europe for less than you can get the train to London. So money is not an excuse not to innovate, right? And in fact, what's really interesting is companies like Unilever and Procter and & Gamble and L'Oreal are desperate to find the agile companies like Wren who create an innovative new story for them to get a hold of and to shape. So I think there's a really important story in, in thinking about how much you allocate to innovation and, and actually treating it as an asset in your company. Because if you can treat it as an asset, in the end, when the giants start looking at you because you start to get a bit annoying, which is what I intend to do with my companies, enough annoying for them to talk, then you've got something really powerful because it's a new story and you've taken the market in a new way. It's very, very difficult for the big brands to keep getting PR that's interesting. It's the young, agile, up-and-coming creatives that can be really innovative, and I think that's an asset. So I, I loved your story about fudge um, and urban, the urban story because it's absolutely fitting with... Also, don't be so arrogant to think that the board or the management team have any of the answers most of the time. I mean, we just go through systems. And, and so what I'm saying is I dare you to collaborate with, I, I loved your story about the lady who's take that stylist. And I've written down, who can I find to align to my organic brand, someone that can do that for me. And I hope that's what you guys are gonna take away in your tangential thinking. Um, but I dare you to do something because I promise you it's much more fun to fail interestingly. Does that make sense? Yeah, you like it, right? I, I'd much rather laugh at myself for having tried than never have tried at all. I mean, I'll tell you something. Actually, I'm just going to... Actually, on your tables, you have a picture of the scented brochure. Can you see the swan? There's a swan, right? I kid you not, he's called Sydney. I have a pond, and on it is a swan and this one is called Sydney. This is a true story. And we were taking pictures of Centred out in my garden, because I'm a cheapskate. I've got a nice garden. Might as well use my garden, right? Sydney, I did not train this swan, swam past Centred as we took that picture. So I think sometimes also you create your own luck, and I dare you to be audacious in what you do. So that's part of what my challenge is in about innovation. It's almost like I want to say to you, have the brainstorm, narrow the funnel, and if you get two ideas, go with the most audacious one. Because I think we can be really simplistic and boring, or we can be brave. And I think it's the brave young innovators, who frankly are probably like me and clueless, so we don't know the scale of the risk we take. And, and I think we get old and we get riskless, because we realize maybe, I mean, I was so clueless when I began Pacific, it is pathetic. Um, and what I want to be is I want to be outstanding and I want to be different. And I think the whole community knows that the celebrity play, I mean, again, the Kate Moss piece, stroke of genius. Um, but we can make our own celebrity lifestyles by being audacious and interesting and having an aligned story. So there is Sydney Swan. It leaves a lasting impression. But I made my luck. And, and you don't have to do it expensively. Making connections. I, I loved the Euromonitor stuff. I, I, I'm so clueless <laughs> that even when I sold my first business, which I did very nicely out of, I didn't really understand the market I was in or the buyers that I was targeting. And 
The other thing that I think is an interesting question to raise is the world is such a small place. When you innovate, do think slightly futuristically. If you speak to the owners of LinkedIn and the people in Facebook, they have a five-year vision and a 10-year vision, and they know that they're going to blow their five-year vision out of the water, and they know the world is a very small place. I think something that's really radical, and I've just sort of, again, I wrote it down thanks to Euromonitor speaking, is I thought, why would I traditionally take Centered, which has been launched in Space NK very successfully, and they want it in America. Why take it there if I can take it somewhere else more successfully, faster? Why don't I reverse engineer my growth into emerging markets and see how that plays? And I'm just saying, don't be traditional about the marketplaces that you attack and you enter, because actually, as an entrepreneur who sold to hotels for a living, you have to travel to lots of countries. And I have to say, the diversity and the dynamism and the joy that I experienced by showing people something new in a new market was far more overwhelming. And actually, this is the killer point, a proactive, infectious partnership where both parties were really focused on the end game because they weren't overwhelmed like developed markets. Is that, does that make sense? So it's thinking a moment about not going the traditional route, doing that dysfunctional thing that I think young entrepreneurs probably do better, but I'm not so young anymore, but I'm just trying to remind myself. Um, and I'm desperately trying to stay risk orientated or as opposed to habitually boring. Um, ActiveBod, why does ActiveBod come about? Um, I would like to get really up the nose of Unilever or Procter & Gamble and I'd like them to take me out of the market, as they will do in due course, I hope, but I've got to get them really angry first to pay the price that I want. What I know is, is that I have the first mover advantage of being creative and seeing a niche with ActiveBod because I've created a range of sports toiletries products with a trend in well-being going through the roof. So all I've looked at is what's happening in the current marketplace, what are people talking about, and what's something that I can suit the portability piece. Now, thank God for Unilever's compacting of product into smaller tablets and concentrating liquid, because I have a concentrated shower gel. It's the first one in the market. It's because one day I went to put the wash on, and I thought, bugger me. I can compact my shower gel. I can concentrate it, do the Unilever model, because I've been listening to what they're doing, and I think it's really cool. And I, There's no reason why I can't copy, but copy faster. First mover advantage, perhaps. The other thing that I think we need to concentrate on, which is really interesting, is, is this trend and thinking about ingredients. I have limited skills. Um, I'm not a chemist. But I have been the owner of two very large manufacturing plants, one in Eastern Europe and one in China. I grew up in Asia. And it's kind of normal in my life to, to do that, because I just think, uh, manufacturing to understand the process of what happens, albeit not, I thought the waste chart that you had, Graham, was really interesting, and I, I, I understand that, but I also know that we haven't cracked the thinking around wasted freight, fresh air, we haven't cracked the shape of packaging, the reusability and the repurposefulness. And what I do know is that my children, who I listen to a great deal, are thinking much harder about that stuff, because they're being taught about it. They're being educated at school about well-being and diet. We never got that. We're being, they're being educated about digital. I go to them to get help. It's embarrassing. I bet you do it too. How do I do this, Katie? Thank God for 16 and 14-year-olds. And they're learning about how stuff is done and why it's done in a different way than we ever considered. And I think that is a really good indicator of how the future will work in terms of repurposing, reusing, repackaging, and generating unbelievably interesting stuff that we can do. So I think the portability and innovation, uh, just to repeat. And I think that creativeness around thinking differently about the formulation and ingredient qualities, our consumer expects more and they expect it pretty immediately. Think about this. Um, 
Can anybody give me an example of a product? Oh, a bar of soap. That's a good one, right? A bar of soap used to wash. How many different wash products have we today? How many different products have we got that wash different parts of our body in different ways? And some of them are called scrubs, right? What are the diversifications of the wash range that our kids are going to think of to behave differently so that we get something better or different? So I think that's an interesting. Things go wrong, right? But actually, if you ask the kids and the consumer, you're less likely to have these sweaty, knickered moments because you haven't done your homework. But I also agree with the absolute gut feel mechanism of running a brand and believing in yourself, your knowledge, your positioning, and your values, because the consumer today is much more interested in that community play and recommendation by a friend. They buy because Joe Malone is world famous, and Joe Loves will be successful because Joe Malone brings authenticity to creativity and fragrance. And I hope it works, but I think she's going to have a tough battle. I've just interestingly uh, invested in a brand that I've been stalking for the best part of 15 years. Can you follow me, if possible? There's two of these on each table, so you will have to share, but frankly, I'm, I'm so excited to share this idea with you. Um, can you open this golden bottle, please? This is an 100% organic skin oil. You can do no damage. Even if you're getting chemotherapy, this product will work for you. Okay, so no contraindications. I think that's a really interesting connection with dealing with uh, stages in life. Please do this on your hand on one side. Please do that on the other. And then I want you to put the bottle down, pass it on to your mate, and then rub your hands together. Everybody getting there? Okay. Now, put your hands up to your face. and sniff. I hope nobody feels revolted. Anybody like it? Like it? Okay. Innovation is also not about the packaging. It's not about necessarily the product. It can be about the ritual of when somebody uses and applies the product. My mother thinks I'm trying to sell you fresh air. <laughs> Am I selling you fresh air? Or am I selling you the most valuable commodity in the world, which is a moment of time? So how do you think about when your customer uses your product, how they apply it, what is the last ability, what is the quality of performance? Are you passionately going to demonstrate your customer your product so that they can demonstrate it to a friend because there's something more meaningful about something that happens. And of course, it's difficult with technology and you know, in the spa environment, but I am not versed in that product area. And I think there's a really interesting trend changing about the compacting of the quality of product, not just the quantity. I read recently an amazing article coming out of Korea. Ironically, we were talking about Korea. And there's a skin range that's coming to the market and ironically, Spezia, which is England's 100% Soil Association approved organic brand, has the same lack of water dilution in its ingredients. The problem, educating the customer that product feels slightly greasy, the answer, less is more. It goes further. But how do you educate the customer? That's a challenge. So we've been talking in Spezia on the packaging about how to communicate how much to use when to use it. And I think the visualization of use, so in, in the spa industry, they say use a pea-sized, does that ring bells, pea-sized drop? Is that an international understanding, right? Well, Spezia's products are very much founded in oils, so we want to use probably an average, and we've had a ridiculous conversation about the size of an olive. I mean, do we even call it an average olive? But the point is, is it's also about deliverance. And I think if we can all help educate the consumer, we can do better with reducing waste and doing the right things. So communication. Communication comes on the pack. It comes in the pack. It comes around the pack. What is your consistency of your message? Because the one thing you can't do with your consumer is be inconsistent. If you go to a five-star hotel and you pay 500 euros a night, do you expect a consistently great service? Yes. 
right? You do. So in this premium industry in which I like to play, um, success is very hard, but the team effort counts. So how many within your culture really, really understand the brand values to the point where it is important that the people in manufacturing who are making the product have the same clear understanding of language. And that's where we do need to have marketing and manufacturing and sales and digital who are integral to all the development of success in the same room. You have to lead by your actions. In other words, you have to do the heavy lifting by communicating relentlessly. Something Jack Welsh did is he spent 40% of his working week on his people and his culture because he knew if he embedded that, then innovation would follow. And I'm a great fan of his success. I do believe this. Do you believe this? I hope you believe this. Apple's doing quite profitably. <laughs> I think we can safely say. So, how do you do transformational stuff very quickly? I do think it needs an objective, so, but I call the objective a checklist because I need to keep going back to my transformational objective to make sure that what I'm doing is better and different. How do you do that? You do that with the help of Euromonitor with massive competitive research. What are the other buggers doing? Have you physically got the other buggers products on your desks? How relentless are you about watching their every move? Because when I grew up my first business and made money, I genuinely believe it's because I was terrified of being beaten by the other people. And that's a hell of a great driver. So don't lose time on studying as you are today in the marketplace. I think there's a break-even point where you go to the market, you do the glass of wine, you do the innovation, you go back to the market, you ask them what they think. How are you progressing? Keep going to the market and hearing what the market says. The minute you get distant from the consumer and you're not having the consumer-facing conversations as you develop, innovation is irrelevant. Invest in that. But it doesn't need to be paid for play. I'm not a great... I've seen some great stuff out of facilitated conversations. I've seen some great stuff out of market research. But actually, maybe it's good to get back to an old-fashioned invite some contacts around a table. I think some of the most powerful contacts that you can have is supply chain partnerships, which Graham touched upon. When did you last sit down with your suppliers and say, come to us with an innovation that you're thinking about, but nobody yet has talked to you about to support you to get to the point where they'll buy it? I'll give you a silly example, back to a bar of soap, because remember, I made my money selling bars of soap. I know a lot about soap. In the hotel amenities industry, when you go into a hotel bathroom, they want to impress you, so they want to look like you've got a big bar of soap, right? Do they want to pay for it? No, because the average room night stay is 1.4 across the globe, 67% occupancy. When you open your bar of soap tonight, you will know, notice a dip in the back of your soap, slightly hollowed out. Why? What dip can you put in your product that the consumer doesn't care about or may even appreciate because you're showing care for the environment? Have you thought that way? Have you thought differently? Because I think we need to challenge the norm. So look at the break-even point, go to your cultural uh, marketplace, ask them, and sometimes you even have to disagree and do it anyway because you have to be the trailblazer. Tact tactical play. This is your accountability at doing your market research and entering at the right level, in the right place, with the right partner. I just had a conversation with, um, is it Matthew? Uh, Matt. Matt, sorry, from Matt Superdrug. And we were talking about how even in UK the market is changing and Matt, Matt is from Superdrug and they have just refurbished in amazing style. And they must be really pissing boots off, right? So what is the footfall that is happening in the environment? But actually, in the new digital play, do you need to even begin? And Matt says to me, Superdrug now trials products online, and if they succeed, then they go in store. And it's a much better play for the young brand. So don't be naive that it's all about the glamour and glitz of seeing your product at the airport in duty free, right? Go for the market that's gonna test at least pain. I'm not perfect. Um, 
we recently launched another brand in Boots, and we now call it a trial because it didn't work. Know that language? It's not perfect. Um, measuring performance is uh, a challenge in innovation because it's all so new and there's no benchmark. I'd be very interested to hear if people have got great ways of managing new performance and innovation. But what I think, again, just to repeat is, talk to your marketplace, find a ritual, watch how people behave with your product, become almost a product stalker to see how the competition are doing it. And then relentlessly be an A player. If you haven't read the book Good to Great, which is really a business book about, um, from Jim Collins, never accept mediocrity in anything you do, never. Because innovation has to be A-grade stuff, right? You won't survive, right? You can't, you'll have lots of good ideas, I hope. Lots of good ideas. But the fact is, is you need to filter. You can't do it all. And there's one gem in there that's the most valuable thing. So relentlessly do an A-grade player. And then also the misery day. I never used to do this, so it's just stuff I've learned, but I'll share it. Have a plan B. Have a plan B. I think that's a very broad generalization, but I do think that there is an awareness where you have to go, this isn't working however much I passionately believe in it. And that also comes down to how much work you do in your industry. Um, this is very quickly my group of companies. Each of them has a niche. For me, it's all about improving people's lives. So you can travel faster with Gate A. I have a triathlon company because I'm mad about triathlon. But actually, um, I'm passionate about the toiletries industry, and I do believe this. So I hope I leave you with a message of this, which is, you will make choices. In fact, have we got just a minute? Quick, piece of paper, like this. Get a, get a, get a piece of paper in front of you, get a square, right? Can, can somebody, is there a pen for this board? Oh, cool, right. It's all right. Oh, that's the page. I can write all over it. Good. Draw a square. That is your life. Right? That's your life. And this could be your brand, by the way. And Jessica, do you mind if I use you as a guinea pig? How old are you? <laughs> it doesn't get any worse than 49, okay? How old are you going to be when you die? 80. Shit. Right, that's halfway, Jessica, which means... Are you doing... You're not doing this for Jessica. This, this is you, okay? <coughs> Jessica, there are 24 hours in the day, and you sleep how many of them? Seven or eight. Seven or eight, you lucky cow. <laughs> <laughs> and you're British, right? Is that an assum a fair assumption? Yes. So you do really well at queuing, right? We wait for everything. Brilliant, okay. So we're gonna give a bit of what we call routine in here, okay? That's routine, this is sleep. So all of that is curtains. What's the word for this area of Jessica's life? Sorry? Past. Brilliant, that's exactly the word. That saves time, thank you, Jack. And experience. Right, when do we do most of our learning in life? In traffic jams. In traffic jams is one answer. Actually, it, we do it as a child between one and four, right? One and five, they say. Um, anybody familiar, your international audience, but in, in UK we say, when we go to a park, we say to our kids, don't talk to strangers. What do we do for the rest of our lives today? Mm. So we have to do a lot of unlearning and retrialing in life. So I also have a challenge to you about today, which is don't spend more than 10 minutes with the same person or else you're not going to get around the room and everybody has something to offer. My next question is, what is that word? There is a hint. Thank you. Right. I think I'm up for time, yes? Am I running late? Any questions about any of that drivel? No? Yeah, Graham. Sort of confirmation and observation, and that is that you can, 
you know, when, when people see um, Apple designers talking about Apple products wearing white T-shirts and looking obsessed, then it's the attention for detail thing that's coming across, right? Yeah. It's the passion for the product. But what I would, would want to say is don't think you can only do that if you're Apple. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So, you know, people talk about whether a brand or a product is really emotive for consumers. Well, it's as emotive as you choose to make it. And Hence. there is really a huge opportunity to take things that are otherwise dull and make them incredible. I mean, actually, that's, uh, I love that. I, my first job was selling promotional giveaway items, roughly speaking, pens and pencils, umbrellas, keychains. How many new pens have been invented? And that, I, that always makes me think that you can always do new with old in innovation. And I think that's a really good benchmark. And I think there's a lovely, just very brief touch upon it, because I think it's interesting. The US and the Russians went to the space station and they did a trial. And they came back and the Americans were really frustrated um, because they'd been on their own space station and the Russians had been elsewhere. And they thought finally they would collaborate. And in the collaboration meetings, the Americans were really, they don't understand how the Russians are gathering all the information. And the Americans go into their private room and they go to their creative guys. You know, we, we don't even get damn pens that work. And the Americans quietly went away because they wanted to impress the Russians how technically competent they were. They spent 160,000 US dollars on developing a pen that could write against gravity. And they went back to the next joint collaboration meeting. And they wanted to share this brilliant pen idea with the Russians. And the Russians turned around and said, that's fantastic. We use pencils. <laughs> Thank you.